Hello, this is problem four from this year's International Math Olympiad. It's a number theory problem. I think it's a really nice one and one that you can probably have a go at even with not of a lot of experience in either number theory or in Olympiad type problem solving. It's about an infinite sequence of positive integers, each of which has at least three proper divisors. And we're told that to get each term in the sequence, we take the sum of the three largest proper divisors of the previous term. The problem is to determine all possible values of the first term that would give us such an infinite sequence. Feel free to pause the video and have a try by yourself. To me, the solution was quite surprising. Uh, you can cut to the end if you just want to see the solution. Otherwise, I'll work through the problem step by step. So if we look at the proper divisors and we just take some small examples, the proper divisors of four, for example, would just be one and two because we don't include four itself. The proper divisors of five would just be one. Proper divisors of 6 would be 1, 2, and 3. So there we do have a number with at least three proper divisors. So if we were to try a1 to be 6, for example, the next term would be the sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3, okay, the sum of the three largest proper divisors. It actually gives us back 6 again. And a3, well, we're going to do the same thing again. We get the same three divisors, and we're going to get 6 again. We're going to get an infinite sequence of positive integers. They're all 6, but that's fine. That's exactly what we want in this problem. So a1 equals 6 would be one of the solutions. Let's keep going and see if we can find some more. If we take 8, for example, proper divisors are 1, 2, and 4. Um, but when we sum them, we get 1 plus 2 plus 4 is 7. Now 7 only has one proper divisor, which is 1. So the sequence ends there, and, and that's no good. From that, we can probably notice that if we ever get a prime number, then the sequence is going to fail. All right, let's try a few more examples. We've only got one solution so far, which is a1 is equal to 6. If we take a1 as 10, three largest divisors are 1, 2, and 5. We sum them to get 8, um, but we saw 8 didn't work already because its divisors are 1, 2, 4. Sum them to get 7, and it ends there. If we take 12, for example, 12 has quite a lot of divisors which are 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6, if we're not including 12. The three largest divisors are 3, 4, and 6. Summing them, we get 13, but that's no good. It's odd, it's prime, we end there. So 12 is not a valid solution. Let's try A1 as 15. Its divisors are 1, 3, and 5. We sum them to get 9. Um, 9 is not prime, but it is odd, and it only has exactly two proper divisors, which would be 1 and 3. So that's no good and we end there. We'll do one more example before we start to generalize a little bit. If we take a1 as 18, here are its divisors. The largest three are 3, 6, and 9. Adding them up, we get 18 itself. And again, this is going to repeat again and again. So we are going to get an infinite sequence. a1 equals 18 is a solution. So if we look at what we had in common with the only two solutions we've found so far, they're both multiples of 6. But if you remember, 12 was not a solution. So it's not as simple as saying all multiples of 6 are going to be solutions. The key is that the smallest divisors of 6 and 18 are 2, 3, and 6. Because if the smallest divisors are 2, 3, and 6, the largest divisors then are going to be n on 2, n on 3, and n on 6. Okay, if we think about listing all the factors in order, the three largest divisors besides n itself, are going to come from dividing by the three smallest divisors, excluding 1. Now when we add n on 2, n on 3, and n on 6, we actually get 6n on 6, which is equal to n itself, which is why we get that repeating sequence like 666 um, or 18, 18, 18. So if what we need for a solution is that the smallest divisors have to be 2, 3, and 6, uh, what we can say about a1 is it's got to be 6 times some number k, but that number k cannot be odd and cannot be divisible by 5, okay? Because we don't want 4 or 5 to be in those three smallest divisors. We want those three smallest divisors to be 2, 3, and 6. So we know those are all solutions. It makes sense to ask uh, if any other solutions exist. As a first step, we can ask whether a1 has to be even. So if a1 is odd, um, for example, if we have three factors, three odd factors like 3, 5, and 7, we'd get 105. The three largest divisors then would be 105 divided by 3, 105 divided by 5, and 105 divided by 7. That's going to give 71. And what we can notice there is it's less, and the sequence is going to decrease. 
that's a problem because our sequence is supposed to be infinite. So if we're just decreasing, well, we're going to get either down to one or, or down to a prime number that, that doesn't have three proper divisors. Uh, in general, if a n is any odd number, the three smallest possible divisors uh, besides one are three, five, and seven. So the three largest, the sum of the three largest divisors can be at most a n on three plus a n on five plus a n on seven. The sum of those three is less than a n, so we get a decreasing sequence. Um, also, it's important to note that this sum is going to be odd, okay? Because we have the sum of three odd numbers, which must also be odd. So we're going to get a decreasing sequence of odd integers. It must come to an end. It cannot be infinite. When we talk about the smallest divisors possible there, we're excluding one. If we think about the case we had before when a1 was 15, the three smallest divisors, excluding one, were actually three, five, and 15. So the sum for our next term was actually um, even less than what we see here it was nine over 15. So this is actually a maximum possible uh, next term for any odd a n. So now we know that all terms in our sequence must be even. I think it makes sense next to ask whether it has to be divisible by six. Because we know all a n has to be even, to be divisible by six is equivalent to asking whether it has to be divisible by three. So assume a n were not divisible by three, then the smallest three divisors besides one are two, four, and five. So the largest that the next term could be is the sum of a n over two plus a n over four plus a n over five. That gives 19 a n over 20. Again, it's less than a n. So we're going to get a decreasing sequence, um, which means it must come to an end unless somehow we were to get an a n plus one that is divisible by three. Okay, because we know that if a n is not divisible by three, the next term is going to be less. Now, if somehow a n plus one were divisible by three, then the sequence may stop going down and it may uh, either go back up again or keep repeating on the same number. Now, but is that possible for a n plus one to become divisible by three if a n were not divisible by three? Actually, it's not. And we're going to prove it um, by letting the smallest divisors of n be 2, p, and q. Okay, we already know that 2 has to be one of the smallest divisors because a n has to be even. And assuming p and q are not divisible by 3. We're going to prove that if the sum of those three largest divisors were divisible by 3, it must have been the case that n itself were divisible by 3. So one way to look at it is that for those sum of those three divisors um, to be divisible by three, they must all be leave the same remainder when being divided by three. Um, if they're not multiples of three, then they can either leave a remainder of one or leave a remainder of two. If they're all one, then we sum them, we get a multiple of three. If they're all two remainder three, we sum them, we also get a remainder of three. But as soon as two of them have different remainders, say for example, the first one was one and the second one was two, um, then one plus two would be a multiple of three, and it would mean the third one would need to be a multiple of three. But that would mean n would need to be a multiple of three. Uh, but here we're assuming that those smallest divisors p and q are not divisible by three, so that's a contradiction. All right, so if those three largest divisors are all congruent mod three, leave the same remainder when divided by three, then the same thing must be true about the three smallest divisors. Well, no one of them is two, so which means p and q must also be 2 mod 3. And that's good because it rules out the possibility that one of them were 4. 4 is 1 mod 3. It also rules out the possibility that we have like 2p and 2p. Because p and 2p are going to have different remainders. If p were 1 mod 3, 2p would be 2 mod 3, and vice versa. So the only possibility remaining then is that p and q are both odd. And that's no good because if p and q were both odd, then n over 2, n over p, and n over q would also all have to be odd. Um, so that means their sum would also have to be odd. And we've shown that if any term in a sequence is odd, then the sequence fails. All right, so what we've shown there is that a n does have to be divisible by 3, um, because if it were not, we would get a decreasing sequence where all of those terms were not divisible by 3, which means that a n must be divisible by 6. So we know a1 must be divisible by 6. We know if the smallest divisors are 2, 3, and 6, we will definitely get a solution. 
Um, so the only other cases to think about is what if those smaller de smallest divisors were two, three, and four, or two, three, and five? If we had two, three, and five, for example, then the three largest divisors would be n on two, n on three, and n on five. When we sum them, we get 31 over 30. If our smallest three divisors are two, three, and five, four is not a divisor. So all of n on two, n on three, n on five would be odd. Some will be odd, and we know that does not work. If we think about the smallest divisors being two, three, and four, um, summing up n on two, n on three, and n on four gives 13n over 12. Now, could 13n over 12 be a multiple of six? Actually, it can. So n could have the form, for example, six times 12 times m. And then when we times by 13 over 12, we get 13 times six times m. And so long as m is not divisible by four or five, then we are going to get a solution. And we could keep on repeating that same trick, okay? keep on dividing by 12 and times by 13 to get left with a multiple of six. So, so long as we have a number like six times 12 to the power of t uh, times m, then we are gonna get left with a valid multiple six at the end. So an example like that would be 72, which is six times 12, or like six times 12 squared, or six times 12 times seven, any of those numbers would also be solutions. So we've finally covered all cases and we have our solution. Uh, if it's any number in this form, six times 12 to the t times k. Um, I found that quite surprising, don't know about you. Before I end the video, I'm just gonna give a quick plug. Um, there's a video of Timothy Gowers solving this problem in real time. I think it takes about one hour and 40 minutes to work through it from start to finish. And it's really interesting to see a Fields medalist, mathematician, approaching an unseen problem, working through it, explaining his thinking, you know, messing things up, going back, fixing it up. Uh, so I think I can link to that here and check it out if you're interested.